Chapter 12 Deep within the labyrinth of the Canterlot Caves, Princess Miyamore Cadenza stood with her head pressed flat against a crystal wall, straining to hear the distant sounds reverberating through the rock. Her senses, sharper than those of a normal mortal pony, could detect the muffled echoes of goings-on all over the canterhorn, conducted from vast distances through the solid stone. There was the deep, creaking groan of the towering bulk of the mountain twisting and bending ever so slightly in the winds that whipped about it. There was the confused and muted roar of a thousand pony hooves trotting up and down the cobblestone streets of Canterlot, and there, faint but still horribly distinct, was the sound of a wedding ceremony being conducted in one of the upper halls of the solar chapel, her wedding ceremony, stolen from her by the same creature that had stolen her face, her body, her life, and that would soon steal her husband. She raised her head, looking hopelessly up towards the rocky ceiling above, and groaned in frustration. "'We're never going to save him!' Twilight Sparkle looked back over her shoulder and smiled encouragement. "'We will. We just have to find—' Her voice trailed off as she raised her head again, scanning the cave around her. The crystal walls here were strangely reflective, and she was having some trouble picking out the real exit from among the multitude of false reflections. "'That one, though. Yes, that was it. There!' A starburst of fuchsia magic surrounded both Unicorn and Alicorn. Twilight was far more practiced at magic than Bonbon bon had ever been, and the pair blinked out of existence— a moment later they reappeared almost directly beneath the cavern exit, blinking in the daylight shining down through the crevice overhead. This was it. They had done it. They were going to... The trio of enchanted bridesmaids trotted forward, their eyes burning with livid green light. They smiled grimly and chorused, You're not going anywhere. The little unicorn stepped forward, her horn already sparking with a powerful spell, but Cadence raised a hoof to hold her back. Twilight, no! The queen's enchantment will make them kill themselves if we force our way past. Twilight's head whipped around to look at her companion. What? Then what can we- Yeah! She leapt back in surprise. A vivid green flash flared forth in the chamber as a crackling web of magic blasted out from a nearby cluster of crystals, slamming into the three bridesmaids and sending them skidding off to the left in a confused tangle. What looked like a pale, tattered unicorn mare, her mane bedraggled and her horn still glimmering with green foxfire, stumbled out of her hiding place, panting heavily. She raised a weary head towards the two astonished escapees and snarled, Tell no one and no pony I was here. You overpowered the bridesmaids and escaped on your own. Got it? Caden stammered. But I... what... how? How? Bonbon bon switched her tail in exasperation. Sun and moon, I don't care how. They're bridesmaids for Celestia's sake. You can say you distracted them by tossing a bouquet at them for all I care. Just one question. Can either of you lift the glamour that's been laid on them? It's strong, fueled by stolen love and built by the changeling queen. The two ponies stared blankly at her, and Twilight said, Glamour? Well, it hadn't been much of a hope anyway. <sighs> right, never mind. Just go, hurry. You don't have much time to stop the queen. Princess Cadence stared in amusement at the strange mare, and then spread her wings in preparation for flight and beckoned to Twilight to hop on her back, apparently content to not look a gift horse, so to speak, in the mouth. Twilight, however, hesitated. She seemed to find something about Bonbon's bon's appearance confusing. The changeling raised an eyebrow and snapped, Well, are you going or aren't you? I'm going, but don't I know you? You look really familiar. Bonbon bon stared at the unicorn for a moment and then slapped her forehead with her hoof. Oh, no, right, of course. You're Twilight Sparkle from the Ponyville Library, Princess Celestia's protege. <laughs> Fantastic. She lowered her hoof. Yes, you do know me. I'm Bonbon. Bon. I make sweets. I live with Lyra, the lyre player, and yes, that's Lyra over there. No, I don't usually have a horn. Please don't ask any questions. Neither of us has time for it. She directed a sharp stare at Twilight. Do we now? The unicorn mare stood irresolute for a moment and then shook her head. No, I guess we don't. She hurried to the alicorn's side and scrambled awkwardly on her back. As the two of them rose slowly into the air, the alicorn straining to lift their combined weight, Twilight called, If you can, come by the library. I have some questions I want to ask you. Bonbon bon gave a small smile but said nothing as she watched the two ponies rise up through the vertical shaft of the outside world. When she was certain that the alicorn would be able to bear the burden and they really had escaped, she turned and scrambled over to Lyra and the other two unicorns. Please, please let her be okay. The spell blast mixed with a little bewildering glamour was all she had been able to think of, and she had tried to make it as gentle as she could, but that had been a hard fall, and there were sharp rocks everywhere, and what if Lyra had really been hurt, and... Her pace slowed. Thanks, Celestia. She could see Lyra's sides moving. She was breathing. They were all breathing. And stirring, too, as a matter of fact. Hmm. <laughs> Chrysalis's power was fighting off the effects of her own glamour even faster than she had expected. The unicorn's eyes snapped open, and in a flurry of limbs they righted themselves, horns sparking. Lyra turned to face Bonbon bon with an expression that was a disturbing mix of fury, relief, and fear. 
We didn't get them. Oh, thanks, Celestia. Wait, is that a horn? Where are they? What did you do with... Bonbon, bon, get out. I don't know what I'll do. I don't know what they'll do. They can't escape. No one escapes. They will rot where they are. Where are they? The changeling skittered back, hooves clattering on the stone as the enchanted unicorns advanced. Lyra, I, I can't just leave. It's not... Where are they? Safe. Bonbon, bon, run. Where are they? Run. Where are they? Lyra, please. It, it's over. They escaped. They're outside the caves. There's no chance of stopping them now. The three unicorns paused, staring fixedly at Bonbon. Bon. She remained as she was, limbs frozen in place and breath coming out in short, shallow gulps. The glamour in their eyes flared, and then, as one, their heads swung around to look up at the rift in the cave ceiling. The light-bodied pink mane unicorn Bonbon bon had impersonated in Canterlot, Twinkleshine, if she remembered correctly, intoned, Their hoofprints in below the light, and there are wing marks in the silt. The second unicorn, a blue mare with a short, rough mane, said, Their magic cannot be felt within the caves. And then Lyra, her face expressionless but her voice thrumming with suppressed relief, said, They're gone. They stood like that, limbs held unnaturally straight and heads held unnaturally high, for a moment longer. Then with the suddenness of a candle being snuffed, the twisting, writhing glamour in their eyes guttered and died. Their eyes rolled back in their heads, every muscle in their limbs and bodies slackened as if a thousand tiny marionette strings had been cut, and their limp bodies collapsed to the cold cave floor, tumbling and sprawling over one another like dolls abandoned by a capricious foal. Bonbon's ears flattened in fear. Lyra! Her hooves kicked against the crystal floor as she darted over to a mare friend's side and gingerly lifted her up. The unicorn was breathing shallowly, if at all. No, no, please, Celestia, no! She bent her ear to a mare friend's chest, listening. Hoofsteps sounded behind her, and the absurd glamour-crafted head of Rambo McMacho, or rather Rambo Stud Chunks, peered over Bonbon's shoulder. In a tone of polite interest, the Kelpie inquired, Is she dead? Bonbon listened and waited and waited, and listened, and then her face wrinkled into an exhausted smile, her eyes scrunching shut as tears welled up within them. Oh, thanks, Celestia. She clutched Lyra's body to her own, feeling the warmth of her mare friend's body and the slight movement of her lungs as the unicorn began to breathe again. She's alive. The thing called Snowflake eyed the two of them, her head cocked to one side, and then asked, Why does it matter? To her own very great surprise, Bonbon bon managed to resist the urge to throttle the Kelpie. I'm going to pretend you didn't say that. Well, I didn't mean it like that. Aldervander ambled around the two mares and back into the changeling's field of vision, staring at the unconscious unicorn nervously, as if she had only just noticed some strange and unnerving quality on her appearance. The Kelpie continued, She's just going to die in two years. Or wait, would that be two hundred? I never can remember how long the little vermin live. At any rate, though, what's the point? Sooner or later she'll die. Why is a life like that worth anything at all? What does one do with a mortal life? And now they were back to the death thing again. Save the world, rescue her true love, and provide psychotherapy to a Kelpie. One of these, thought Bonbon, bon, was not like the others. You live, you learn. She stroked Lyra's mane with her hoof. You love, and eventually you die. How inspirational. Licking her lips hesitantly, Aldervander said. But how do they stand it? The fear, I mean. Why don't they all just collapse into mewling puddles of despair whenever they remember what's waiting for them? Bonbon bon rolled her eyes. It's easier after the first few dozen fits of existential dread. You get numb to the idea. Ah, I see. Um, yes. The Kelpie considered this. Purely as a matter of curiosity. About how long does it take for this numbness to set in? How many minutes are we talking here? I don't know. It varies. Probably a couple million. Did you say something? In a voice that was several registers above her, even her usual screech, Aldervanda answered, I just said gleep. I felt like saying it. Sometimes I feel like saying things. This time it felt like saying gleep. Several million? That adds up to a few years, right? I'm probably lowballing it, come to think of it. Some ponies prefer to just go into denial. That's an option? The Kelpie twitched her ears up in interest. Why didn't you say so? That's not hard at all. Anyone can do denial. Yes, indeed. She paused for a few moments, considering, and then in a reflective tone she repeated, Anyone can do denial. Mm, go check the others. There was no disgust or annoyance in Bon Bon's voice, which was a shame, because it felt somehow wrong to be talking to the she without simultaneously wanting to kill her. Somehow, though, as she cradled Lyra in her hooves, alive and whole, the changeling found that she just couldn't seem to muster up any bitterness right now. The Kelpie trotted over to one of the other ponies, sniffed it, and said, Alive and fast asleep. Insert witticism here. Bon Bon blinked. What? 
Oh, come now. You can't expect me to come up with glittering repartee without pause. Even the best and brightest must needs rest their rapier tongues every now and again. Oh, and this one's alive, too, and just as unconscious, she chuckled. That idiot changeling. All power and no subtlety. Hardly the sort of thing one hopes from a queen of the she. Somewhat reluctantly, Bonbon bon tore her gaze away from Lyra and turned to look at the Kelpie, who had just noticed the pebble had gotten glued to her tail tip and was trying to bite through the hairs attached to it. What do you mean? Sharp teeth slid together with a snap, and the offending hairs and pebble were removed. Rambo's stud chunks craned her head over her shoulders, trying to see if she had picked up anything else. Well, it's obvious what happened, yes. Her scrawniness gave them all manner of instructions what to do while her prisoners were in the cave, but she never bothered to give them any rules for what to do if the prisoners ever got out. She gestured to the comatose pony at her side. The glamour tried to deal with that and wasn't even able to comprehend it, metaphorically speaking. And then schlacked! The Kelpie made a noise rather like a cat trying to regurgitate a hairball, which was presumably supposed to be an onomatopoeia of some sort. The spell popped like a rotting frog in the sun, and since it was locked in their juicy little pony brains, down they went too. Tragically, I doubt there's much that can be done about it. They'll just stay like this until something eats them or they die of thirst. If it should come to that, by the by, I vote the first option. It's both far more merciful and far tastier. Not that there's much hope left. Laying peculiar stress on her words, the Kelpie added, why, it would take a miracle to save them now. Bonbon bon said nothing, her head bent over Lyra and her brow creased in thought. Beefy McMacho waited a few moments and then repeated, I said, it would take a miracle to save them now, as in a nice impressive miracle should probably be the next order of business. No response. Snowflake, ne Beefy McMacho, ne Rambo Studchunks, ne Utricularia the Shellycoat, ne Aldrovandra the Kelpie, frowned. That was a conversational nicety which I believe is referred to as a hint, but you appear not to have gotten my drift. Allow me to continue snowing. The laws of physics, reality, and sanity are in your way, and I want you to vanquish them. She lowered herself down to the damp cave floor, reclining cat-like, or pot-bellied pig-like, considering her current shape, with her forehoofs crossed, and continued, Vanquish them so that I can watch. Bonbon bon glanced up at the Kelpie. <laughs> Sorry, I have a strict one miracle per day policy. Ah, the Kelpie of too many names considered this. So should I come back tomorrow, then? Not if you're hoping for a miracle. Bonbon's gaze drifted back down to Lyra. The unicorn's tousled mane hung stiffly over her horn and half covered her eyes. She looked so peaceful now, so calm. The changeling smiled a strange, bittersweet smile. No more miracles for me. It's over, Kelpie. The alicorn and Sparkle will warn the princesses, and against them, well, Chrysalis doesn't stand a chance. The entire invasion should be over in a few hours, and then it'll be safe to come out and get help. Perhaps the alicorn imprisoned here couldn't do anything, but I can't imagine the princesses won't be able to cure them. I'll wait a bit, grow wings, I've got enough strength for that, at least thanks to Lyra. Find Princess Luna, ask her for help. Is that not a bit redundant? Bonbon bon tilted her head in puzzlement. I don't follow. Well, it's your business, of course. The she gave an enormous yawn, triangular lizard-like teeth gleaming in her cavernous mouth. She smacked her lips several times, eyes half-lidded, and grinned. But quite frankly, I do not see the logic in telling this Luna to come down here when I've already done so myself, as per your instructions. Bonbon bon blinked several times in rapid succession. What are... I don't. Oh, for goodness sake. Look, Kelpie, at this point I honestly don't care much if you lie to me or not. But I would at least like the lies to make sense. Just tell me what you're trying to manipulate me into doing. It'll be easier for both of us, believe me. Lie? Me? The Kelpie's head snapped up bright, goatish eyes wide in innocent surprise. The soul of honesty? The ne plus ultra of sincerity? My dear Bonbon, bon, you wrong me. She raised herself to her hooves with a grunt and stretched. Naturally, I told the Moon Pony that you were down here. I may not be the brightest she in the world, although I probably am, mind you, but if not, I hope at least that I'm intelligent enough to follow a simple instruction. Snowflake, possibly, gestured vaguely towards the floor of the cave. I imagine the princess is down in the darksome deeps right now, still searching away for you and your... Bonbon bon directed a cockatrice glare at the Kelpie, and she faltered and finished somewhat lamely with, Eh, that is to say, the both of you. Right, of course. And I imagine you also told her the pink alicorn was really a changeling. With an apologetic shrug and a wistful sigh, the bulky white knot pony said, Sadly, no. As I said, I can easily follow simple instructions like, Tell the moon pony I'm under canterlot and need rescuing, but forgettably, Tell the moon pony I'm under canterlot and need rescuing, and also tell her that some individual or other really is chrysalis, qualified as complex instructions, and thus was beyond my poor capabilities. Rest assured, though, I did tell her that you were in need of aid and succor. I told her, like the dickens, you would have been proud of how thoroughly I told her, and since you seem inexplicably inclined to distrust me, I see no other option but to back up my statements. 
The Kelpie paused theatrically, her short crew-cut mane lengthened, falling in dripping waves of waterwheel, bladderwort, and pondweed over her suddenly bony body. Her white coat blackened and shrunk, and her bulging muscles turned into branches, fracturing sheets of glass, shodden upholstery an empty turtle shell, and a saddlebag. False legs shrank back into her body, and true pebble-coated legs unfolded, and as her tail flowed out to its old length, she curled it forward, holding its tip in front of her face. Dangling from a few of the longest threads of hair, or perhaps waterweed, as it was nearly impossible to tell, was a hollow glass globe. Aldervandra grinned a toothy grin and finished, With proof. With whip-cracked suddenness, the Kelpie swung her long tail downward, smacking the tip against the damp floor. The tiny sphere shattered with a pure, iconic tone. Shards of curved glass skittered away across the rock, and Bonbon bon knelt to examine one that had come to rest near one of her forehoofs. It had been etched with a thin, curving line, rather like the crescent of a new moon. There was a sound of hoofsteps, and the changeling raised her head to see that Aldervandra had trotted over to the edge of the platform upon which they were standing, and was squinting down into the darkness below. She turned to look at Bonbon. Bon. "'There, see, she's coming already. You're right about her mane, you know, remarkably like the night sky.' Now thoroughly confused, Bonbon bon stepped hesitantly to the brink of the pit, careful to keep a few yards between herself and the Kelpie in case this is some sort of bizarre ploy to push her off the edge. Aldervandra, I don't see anything. She trailed off. Reflected in her eyes was the light of distant, impossible stars, shining up from the cavernous blackness below. In a voice oozing with more smug satisfaction than should have been physically possible, Aldervandra said, I do believe a certain changeling owes a certain Kelpie an apology. Still staring at the approaching patch of starlight, Bonbon bon stammered, But you betrayed me. You said you told Chrysalis. But you told Princess Luna too? And, ah, oh, my head. Hooves wrapped in stone clinked against the cave floor as Aldervandra turned and sauntered away from the precipice, the detritus clinging to her body, swaying and rattling around her. I admit I did intend to betray your treason to your queen and leave it at that. She hoisted herself up on top of the crystal ridge that she and Bonbon had concealed themselves behind earlier and turned to look back at the changeling. Her goatish eyes gleamed. But then, repulsive and abhorrent as you are, no offense intended, of course, I merely mention it, I can not say that I admire the unseelie court much more. They're just so demanding. Be more ferocious, Aldervandra. Report on the changing, Aldervandra. Don't be so lazy, Aldervandra. Don't eat the crown prince, Aldervandra. It's always weird me, and I couldn't resist getting a little of my own back and spoiling at least some of their plans. Ignoble of me, no doubt. With a clattering thud, the Kelpie dropped out of view, and there was a sound of receding hoofsteps as she trotted off into the shadows. Faintly, Bonbon bon heard her call back. But what can I say? You just make treachery look so fun. Princess Luna arrived shortly afterwards, sweeping up out of the abyss in a rush of shadow, starlight, and majesty. Bonbon, bon, who was still feeling the effects of Aldervandra's company, found it a little difficult to explain things to the Alicorn, but eventually she managed to communicate the fact that, yes, she was the fae who spoke to us a near fortnight past, and that an Alicorn princess had been imprisoned, but had escaped not long before Luna herself had arrived. Luna took this in fairly composedly, although upon hearing that the Alicorn at Canterlot was an impostor, her wings did twitch briefly, as if she were about to take flight, and after looking at the sleeping Twinkleshine nearby and casting a stern glance in Bonbon's bon's direction, the princess set her horn aglow and began to work at the fragmented glamour hobbling their minds. It was a tense time for Bonbon, bon, quite apart from Luna's habit of muttering unnerving observations to herself while she worked. A curious charm, this. A pox upon it, that was not supposed to happen. I don't believe I've ever seen the likes of this magic before. The changeling peace of mind was not helped by some of the extremely pointed questions that the princess directed at the ponies as they recovered. Lyra, who she revived first, she seemed content not to question too closely, although Bonbon bon noticed the princess kept an ear half turned towards her and her mare friend while she cured the other two ponies. She seemed particularly interested in a portion of their conversation that followed almost immediately after the two ponies had gotten past the first few moments of crying and comforting. Lyra had wiped her eyes on Bonbon's bon's mane, and her nose a little bit, but considering things the changeling didn't really mind, drawn back from their embrace and looked her mare friend up and down. Then, in a voice that was just a little too jaunty, she said, So, you have a horn now. This was not going to be fun, Bonbon bon sighed. Yes, yes I do. This was not going to be fun in so very, very many ways. After waiting for something more and receiving nothing, Lyra prompted, And, uh, what's up with that? Bonbon bon opened her mouth, closed it, and then averted her eyes, her face pinched and her ears flattened in shame. She had known she would have to have this talk. Why couldn't that foreknowledge have made this any less terrible? Several seconds passed. Lyra's forced smile faded. No, just no, Bonbon. Bon, this isn't the same thing as you having weird fits every so often. Your voice changing all the time or being allergic to weird things. 
You have a horn in the middle of your forehead. Listen, Bonnie, I love you, but that kind of needs an explanation. She held up a hoof as Bonbon started to speak and continued. I know, I know, once we're out of the cave. But we're pretty darn near to out of the cave right now, aren't we? Hey, we've got Princess Luna here. I can't imagine that you telling me what's up with, with everything would cause any kind of real trouble. But if it did, I bet you bits to Baklava that her royal highness would be able to handle it. She was right, of course. She was completely right. It was safe now. No matter how Lyra reacted to the truth, Princess Luna would make sure that she stayed safe. In that light, there was no reason not to tell Lyra everything now. Bonbon bon raised her head, meeting Lyra's stern gaze. In a low voice that, thankfully, didn't even have the slightest hint of a comical accent, she said, All right, but I just... Lyra, you're right. This isn't some little mistake I made, or some weird disease I'm ashamed of, or something like that. This is big, and if I tell you, you'll... It's going to change everything, for you, for me, for us. I just think that maybe it might be better if there weren't... If we were alone when I tell you. She drew a deep breath and continued unsteadily. But if you want, I'll tell you now. It's your choice. There was a long, heavy silence, burdened with thought. Luna now had both ears twisted back in their direction and looked like she was having trouble resisting the urge to turn her head as well. Twinkleshine, who had just been dispelled and had gotten over her initial panic attack, was frankly gawking. Lyra may have noticed this, because eventually she nodded and said, Okay, I'll wait. When Bonbon bon tried to apologize, the pale green mare shushed her and dragged the topic of discussion to lighter matters, evidently unwilling to talk about the subject weighing heaviest on both their minds. Not long after an objective time and an agonizing eternity later in Bonbon bon and Lyra time, Princess Luna stepped back from the last unicorn, Colgate apparently, finally freed of Chrysalis's glamour and announced, I would that I could linger to aid you, but Canterlot is in peril and the time for me to act may come at any moment. The way to the city is not rough. I counsel you, though, not to hurry thither too swiftly. It may well be unsafe. Keep out of the line of sight, and all should be well. Now come you to me, and I shall loft you to the surface, and then make my farewells. No sooner said than done. Even with the prospect of her impending heart to heart with Lyra, Bonbon bon had no desire to spend any more time below ground, and the others were even more eager to be on the surface again. Colgate stepped forward, and the princess's horn glowed as the unicorn rose up through the rocky fissure to the surface. Twinkleshine stepped forward, and she too was lifted above. Bonbon bon stepped forward, but Luna motioned her back and pointed at Lyra. Unicorn glanced at Bonbon bon and gave a small smile and nodded, and then Lyra stepped forward and she too was carried up out of the caves after the others. Bonbon bon watched her until she passed from sight, and then turned to look up at Princess Luna, standing tall and regal in the dark. With an air of resignation, the changeling said, "'Well, your highness, I would speak with you, spirit, concerning your friend.' Luna paused for a moment at the last word, and it occurred to Bonbon bon that a mare falling in love with another mare was probably one of those things that just wasn't done a thousand years ago. Hoping fervently that this wasn't the prelude to a righteous smiting, Bonbon bon prompted. Yes. Fortunately, smiting did not appear to be on the princess's mind. She is fond of you, I deem, and unless I much miss my mark, you are deeply fond of her. I confess I do not quite understand this, but my sister assures me that in these times— she halted, evidently feeling that she had gotten a little off track, and continued, "'Well, that is no matter. You love one another. This is so?' Simple question. Simple answer. "'Yes.' "'I see. Then I have but one further question for you. I observe that, just as you are not entirely honest with me during our recent meeting, changeling. I, it is clear enough, thy disguise is too masterful for you to be of any other clan. You have likewise not been honest with her. This must not continue.' Her eyes narrowed. Have I your word that you will tell her what you are? At first, Bonbon bon did not respond. Then she raised her head, stared fiercely up into the alicorn's eyes, and replied in a voice strong and steady as the mountain's roots. She has my word. Luna held Bonbon's gaze for a long, long moment, considering the little changeling with stern eyes and unreadable face. Then the princess's expression abruptly softened into a gentle smile. That is sufficient for me. She gave a short, whinnying laugh, genuine but tinged with the memory of an old sadness. When all is said is done, who am I to pass judgment on thee, on you? My life has not been without its own darknesses, and be you ever so wicked, you would have to work long and hard to match my own sins. Yet even as I was forgiven, when forgiveness I sought, meet it is that you be given the same chance. Uh, thank you, princess. Bonbon bon looked away, her ears lowered. I can't expect forgiveness, though, and I don't dare ask for it. I see. The light of the distant sun gleamed in the moon princess's eyes as she raised her head, looking up through the long, twisting shaft of the outer world. She glanced back down at Bonbon bon and smiled. But perhaps you will find it, nonetheless. I did. 
Soft blue light gleamed on crystal facets and shone on the damp stone floor as a swirl of magic crept up Princess Luna's horn. "'Tis a time both of us were away, I deem. My part in the defense of Canterlot has not yet come. Tia, that is, my sister, Princess Celestia, insists that certain projects of hers be granted a chance to shine ere I step forth. And I, well, she has a strong will. Her mane swirled in the air like a cloud caught in a gale as she shook her head. But that is no concern of thine. Suffice it that I may well be needed shortly. Now, to the surface with you. The light of the princess's horn flared out, and Bonbon bon felt rippling waves of magic wrap themselves around her, lightening her weight. As she drifted up into the air, rising past the rough, moss and lichen draped walls of the shaft towards the light above, Luna called up after her Farewell, spirit, and again, I thank you for your warning. Quiet and hidden your service to Equestria may have been, but without it we would have been caught completely unawares, and this day might have been fell indeed. Your deeds will not be forgotten. A cold upland wind rushed and whispered through the tall grass of a steep mountain meadow, and gently shook the mint-green mane of a small unicorn, sitting on her haunches in the shadow of a small rocky outcropping and gazing out over the wind-whipped field at the shining white city of Canterlot beyond. The great forest field that had protected it earlier was gone, and she could just make out innumerable black specks in the distance, some storming through the air above the city like biting flies, and others crawling, tick-like, over its gleaming marble masonry. Twinkleshine and Colgate had taken one look at the scene and had hurried back into the deeper shadows, huddling near the muddy, sloping pit in the cave's floor that led into the deeper and greater caverns beneath the Canterhorn. But Lyra had chosen to say and watch. Whatever was happening here was big, and it was too important to miss. Moreover, after all the time spent struggling against the dark of the caverns and the dark of her half-slaved mind, she desperately needed some fresh air, light, and wind, even if, apparently, they came with a side of apocalypse. There was a muted commotion back in the shadows of the cave, and Lyra turned, her face lighting up as she saw the cause of the noise. Bonbon! Bon! Rocks and loose bits of sod tumbled down around the green unicorn as she clambered to the floor of the little cave and trotted over to her mare friend, who was currently struggling to her hooves after having been dumped unceremoniously on the cave floor by Luna's magic. Lyra hoisted her up, brushed her off, leaned back and inspected her for cuts and scrapes, and then gave her a quick hug. Then, turning to the other two unicorns, she jerked a hoof towards the weedy entrance to the little cave and snapped, Right, you two. Out. My mare friend who is suddenly a unicorn and I need to have a talk. Colgate lashed her tail in irritation and observed, not unreasonably, that there was some kind of war going on out there, and if Lyra wanted privacy, she could get it the hay outside the cave, thank you very much. Twinkleshine, showing an admirable economy of words, expressed the same sentiment by simply raising an eyebrow, opening her mouth wide as a bullfrog and saying, What? Then, apparently feeling that she had stumbled on a really pithy phrase and would be ashamed to let it go to waste, she repeated, No, but seriously, what? For a moment, Lyra looked as though she might argue the point, but then she rolled her eyes and motioned her mare friend to follow her outside. The nimble unicorn hopped and scrabbled her way up and out of the grassy, overgrown hole leading to the outside world, then turned and lowered a hoof for Bonbon bon to grab. The changeling drew a deep breath, exhaled, and hooked her hoof around Lyra's and allowed herself to be pulled up into the daylight. It was time. They stood together for a moment, looking out at the black swarms buzzing around the towers of Canterlot. Then Lyra sighed, gave a, yeah, but what can we do about it, shrug, and turned to Bonbon. Bon. Look, Bonnie, I know that... It was at this moment that Twinkleshine, or possibly Colgate, chose to shout, Hey, crazy! Princess Luna wants to talk to your mare friend! Bonbon bon felt an immense wave of relief, then immediately felt ashamed of herself for feeling relieved, while Lyra pursed her lips together and very pointedly did not say several extremely uncomplimentary things about the two unicorns in the cave. The green unicorn glanced at Bonbon, bon, who smiled sheepishly and called, "'Tell her we're out here. Oh, hello, your highness.' With a quick shake of her head, Princess Luna dislodged a stray piece of sod from her black tiara and hoisted herself the rest of the way out of the cave. She nodded greetings to both mares. Forgive my interruption, my errand, though twofold is simple, and I shall not tarry long. First, she walked several paces down the hill and spread her wings facing Canterlot. Come ye and stand behind me. Seeing their hesitation, she added, Quickly now, if I sense truly, time is short. With some hesitation, Bonbon bon and Lyra trotted back behind Luna and then stood there, feeling rather foolish. Several seconds passed. Grasshoppers droned in the sun-warmed grass, and a meadowlark sang, while in the distance the changeling swarm continued its assault on Canterlot as Luna watched with remarkable impassivity. Several more seconds passed. And then, quite without warning of any kind, Canterlot exploded. A piercingly, painfully bright white light shone from somewhere in the middle of the great city. Then a magenta wave of seething, glowing energy rushed outward, sweeping soundlessly through turrets, parapets, walls, and towers without having any apparent effect on them. At first, indeed, Bonbon bon thought that, spectacular as the explosion had been, it had done nothing at all. 
and then she noticed the thousands of tiny black specks flailing helplessly as the turbulent flood of magic swept them away from the city. Luna's eyes narrowed as she braced herself, spreading her wings wide and setting her horn aglow with magic. The blast front plunged towards them, now half a mile distant, now a furlong, now a hundred yards, and then there was a bone-shaking crack and roar as the shockwave struck them, parting around Princess Luna and flowing harmlessly by them like whitewater split by a great boulder amidst the rapids. For a moment all was light and fury, and then the worst of it had passed them by, and even the roar of raw magic rushing through the air was dwindling away into nothing. The echo of the blast sounded off the nearby mountains, reverberating and re-reverberating, and with ponderous grace and majesty the rolling thunder slowly faded away. And every last changeling but one on the canterhorn had been swept away, never to return. With a sigh of relief, Luna folded her wings. My sister planned truly after all, though her methods I cannot quite... Well, she turned to face the two mares. Lyra spluttered. Wait, so that's it? It's over? But how? What? The princess inclined her head. Indeed, it is all over. No changeling, or at least no changeling who was caught in that great magic, she cast a swift, significant glance at Bonbon, bon, remains in Canterlot, or on the Canterhorn. Equestria is safe. But wait, hold on. Lyra plunked herself down on her haunches and gestured with a hoof. There were hundreds of them, thousands, and they were just sent packing, just like that. All that power, all that evil. Aye, she nodded. The Fae are truly evil beings, and that evil is a clinging, choking thing not easily banished. But there are some forces that may drive it out, whether wedded to magic in this case or merely standing on its own. Love, for example. The princess smiled at some secret joke of her own. Indeed, I suspect that that was responsible in this case, perhaps in others as well. Thankfully, she didn't send any more significant glances in Bonbon's direction, which was just as well as the little changeling was almost beginning to wish that she had been carried away by the spell. Moving with slow, deliberate steps, Princess Luna walked over to the shadowed entrance to the caves. "'It would seem I am in no great hurry, after all. Nonetheless, I know that you have much to discuss, and so I will be brief with regard to the second errand I have with you.' Her horn glowed a vivid ultramarine. At first nothing appeared to happen, then there came the sound of some squawking, struggling thing somewhere in the deeps. There was a sudden scream from the two unicorns still within the cave. Luna rolled her eyes, and then a white, heavily muscled thing, vaguely resembling a pegasus, emerged from the hole before her, struggling and complaining in the grasp of the princess's magic. Luna cast a dismissive glance at it and turned to Bonbon. Bon. Is this yours? Elder Vondre, who was currently floating upside down in midair, craned her thick neck back until she could see Bonbon bon and said in a gruff, grating voice, Hey, name's Snowflake. Pretty mare, I work out. The Kelpie raised a forehoof and pumped it. Yeah! There was a moment of total silence. Bonbon bon heaved the sigh of a changeling who had both borne the weight of the world on her shoulders and then had it talk sass to her, and said in a dull, flat voice, Honestly, Rambo's stud chunks fits you better. Do you really think so? Tombstone teeth shrank into gleaming reptilian fangs, and a white coat blackened and bulged into an impossibly diverse array of junk and detritus. Snowflake's short mane and tail flopped out into the Kelpie's long, green, dripping tresses, and Aldervander's goat-like eyes gleamed mischievously. I confess the name does appeal to me, but I thought it might be a tad much. Snowflake has such a delicious sense of incongruity to it, don't you agree? Sure, why not? With a quick gesture of her hoof, Bonbon bon beckoned to Lyra, who was inching backwards with her eyes fixed on the scabrous, dripping thing held in Luna's magic. It's okay, you don't have to worry, she's kind of harmless. Um, For some inexplicable reason, this did not seem to reassure Lyra all that much. In an appalled whisper, she gasped, What is that? Ooh, introductions, Aldervandra beamed toothily. You're Lyra, of course, and you're not Bonbon's pet. Delighted to make your acquaintance. You appear to be, uh... She paused, apparently struggling to come up with something complimentary, and then concluded, Meaty. You look commendably meaty, yes. Um, thank you? Making a valiant effort to salvage some semblance of normal social interaction from the conversation, Lyra responded, You look, uh, meaty too, I guess. The Kelpie raised an eyebrow. There's no call to be insulting. But you just... With a magnanimous wave of her hoof, Aldervander said, Don't worry, I forgive you. I'm sure it would break Bon Bon's sweet, pure little heart to have us squabbling. She's dull like that. But, she added, I could be wrong. She's certainly flouting convention now by leaving my identity unknown to you. Introductions, Bon Bon, introductions. Lyra looked at her mare friend helplessly. Bon Bon? Bon Bon clapped a hoof over her face. Celestian Lu- oh, I'm so sorry, your highness. I didn't mean- It just slipped out. With a stern face and twinkling eyes, Luna said, Nay, do not apologize, no offense is taken. I believe you're about to explain this creature to your friend. If Bonbon bon hadn't known better, she would have sworn that Luna was actually finding this amusing. With a sigh, she muttered, Lyra, this is Aldervandra. She's kind of, uh, 
fairy called a Kelpie, and a bedraggled she gesticulated wildly. <laughs> what? Bonbon bon stared blankly at the Kelpie for a moment, and then rolled her eyes. Of course, how silly of me. Lyra, this is apparently Utricularia, the shelly coat. Nah! Whisking around to face Alder Vonder and stamping her hoof on the ground, the changeling demanded, Well, what do you want me to say that you are? The Kelpie gestured with a forehoof. Say that thing you said a few days back, that incredibly complimentary thing. I want to make a good first impression. Bonbon bon blinked and then said in a flat voice, I have never said anything complimentary about you in my entire life. Raising a hoof in front of her face, Alder Vondra tilted herself over towards Luna and said, I swear, memory like a stickleback. It was possible that she thought she was whispering, but if so, she was mistaken. To Bonbon, bon, she said, Sure you have. Don't you remember? It was the morning after I impersonated. You're definitely not a pet here. You said I was an unholy abomination, and... She smiled expectantly. Bonbon bon buried her face in her hooves. Lyra said, Wait, what was that about impersonating me? Oh, yes. That was a fun night. After she impersonated you, Lyra, I tried to kill her, and then she broke down our bathroom door. That's the bathroom doorknob hanging from her ear, incidentally. Everyone, every pony, oh, hang it, everyone involved had the time of their lives. After a few deep, calming breaths, which frankly were not nearly as calming as she had hoped they would be, the changeling continued. And right, of course, how could I forget? Lyra, this is Alder Vondra. She is an unholy abomination and an affront to reality itself. That's not a figure of speech, by the way, chirped Alder Vondra. The universe really does despise me. You're now looking at a literal thing that should not be. Go on, drink it in. Raising an eyebrow, the changeling said, so you've actually accepted it, huh? Well, the wonders never cease. Accepted it? Accepted what? Much as I appreciate your companionship, I do wish you would at least try to keep the driveling to a minimum. Aldervander halted mid-sentence, eyes widening in horror as she realized the implications of what she had just said. For a moment she said nothing, then hurriedly added, When I said I was literally an abomination, I meant uh, figuratively literally, of course. I mean, it's not like I'm really going to di- The she are- I can uh. She trailed off, clutching her limbs protectively around her cluttered, angular body like a dying insect, and then a defeated little murmur said, I'm not fooling anyone, am I? No, Bonbon bon shook her head. Not even yourself, anymore. Glass, stone, and wood rasped and scraped against one another as the Kelpie pulled her legs a bit tighter around her body. I won't say it, though. I don't have to say it. You can't make me say it, and I'll never ever want to say it, so if you think for a moment that— Yes, fine, whatever. Massaging her forehead with a crooked hoof, Bonbon bon said, You don't have to say anything. Good. Aldervanda hunched her shoulders, peering over her crossed forelimbs at the little changeling. Just so we're clear on that. At this point, Lyra, who had been listening in helpless confusion to this exchange, nudged Bonbon and in a doubtful tone said, You sure she's not dangerous, Bonnie? She seems kind of unstable. Yes, well, honestly, she is kind of unstable. The magic web holding the Kelpie aloft momentarily brightened, and Luna said, You have no need to fear. She shall not break free. Turning to Bonbon, bon, the princess said, I will be brief. This creature has, I gather, done you great wrong, for reasons that are not clear to me. She, Aldervander, who appeared to have been trying to brood, or possibly even introspect, raised her head with an indignant squawk. Great wrong! I have been like a mentor to her. I tolerated her weird perversions, gave her sage advice, regaled her with humorous and instructive... <clears throat> a magical aura shone around Aldervander's head, and a little brass zipper slid across her mouth, fastening it shut. After a few more attempts at speech, the Kelpie made a muffled noise of indignation and lapsed into silence. Her forehoofs crossed pettishly. The glow of magic around Princess Luna's horn dimmed. Bonbon bon was filled with a feeling of great peace. Princess Luna swished her tail irritably, a bizarre sight as her diaphanous, drifting tail was not entirely physical and appeared to flow rather than swish. For a moment, Bonbon bon had the strangest impression of some of the star-like specks of light in the alicorn's tail had gleamed blue as they shifted towards her, and red as they drew away, and said... As I was saying, I bade this creature summon me immediately once she had found you or any pony else in need of aid, but I gathered that she did not do so, endangering you in the process, and treating me as little better than a dog to be called or held at bay as she willed. Glancing back at the Kelpie in disdain, Luna continued, I sensed her in the caves, and after bearing you to safety, I retrieved her. Rrr, said Aldervandra, scowling. Retrieved her, continued Luna demurely, with the intent of making her answer for her transgressions. Lowering herself to the verge, Luna glanced back at the Kelpie, who had managed to flip herself around so that her back was to the three of them and was trying mightily to twist around again so that she could see what was happening. The princess shook her head and returned her attention to Bonbon. Bon. She requested, however, that you be the one to pass judgment upon her. And considering that it is you who have been wronged most by her actions, upon reflection I saw no reason to gainsay that request. So, Luna drew her head back, considering Bonbon bon through half-lidded eyes, what shall her fate be? Somewhat hesitantly, Bonbon bon stepped forward, looking up at the squirming Kelpie. 
With an awkward twist and wiggle, the creature writhed upside down, allowing her to look at Bonbon as well. Altervandra's eyebrows danced erratically in what was presumably an attempt to convey some sort of message. In a low, pensive tone, Bonbon said, You, you've caused me so much trouble, you know. Every step of the way, you've been trying to stop me, doing everything you could possibly think of to make sure that I didn't get to Lyra. Lying, stealing, delaying, betraying, insulting, mocking, on and on and on. No matter what, I just couldn't shake you. You just wouldn't go. And now here you are, and here I am. And what will become of us, you and I? <laughs> said Aldervandra, and somehow managed to smirk ingratiatingly despite the zipper across her mouth. There was no response from the changeling other than a long, steady stare, and Aldervandra's smirk slowly faded as Bonbon, her face blank and unreadable, considered the creature that had caused her so much aggravation and misery. Then the changeling heaved a heavy sigh. But on the other hoof, without you, Luna would never have come to the caverns, and Lyra and the other two would still be enchanted. Without you, I would have given up there in the deeps. <laughs> Bonbon shook her head. Sorry to disappoint, but no, I really would have. And come to think of it, without the lies you told Chrysalis about me murdering you, she would have just done away with me then and there, instead of choosing a longer, slower way that gave Lyra and me a chance. Hey, without you, I never would have known about the invasion in the first place. Without you, Chrysalis might have won. In an extremely empathic tone, the Kelpie said, <laughs> paused for a moment and added helpfully, Hmm? <laughs> Rubbing her forehead with her hoof, Bonbon bon said, Oh, fine, I guess so. With a glance up at Luna, she said, I can't believe I'm saying this, but set her free. We're even, as far as I'm concerned. The princess shrugged. On thy head be it. The magic swirling around the Kelpie dissolved into the air as she tumbled down to the ground with a rush and a ruckus. There was a small pop of inrushing air as the zipper across her mouth vanished, and Aldervandra snapped, Really, Bonbon, bon, that took far too long. I had hoped you would arrive at the right decision with a bit more promptitude. "'Ungrateful creature,' muttered Luna, rising to her hooves. She turned to Bonbon bon and Lyra. "'Well, I shall retrieve Colgate and Twinkleshine, and we shall all away. No doubt you have much to discuss with one another.' With a gesture towards Aldervandra, she added, "'Shall I remove this as well?' "'I have hooves,' squawked the Kelpie, her voice rattling with indignation. "'I can walk.' "'As you will.' The princess nodded farewell to them, trotted up to the entrance to the caves, and edged her way inside. There was a brief sound of muffled conversation, then the grass stems and brush overhanging the cave's mouth were momentarily backlit by a burst of bright blue light, accompanied by the distinctive ringing hiss of a teleportation spell. Aldervandra watched this with interest, and then turned to Lyra and Bonbon, bon, a broad, toothy grin plastered across her face. She looked like a jovial crocodile. "'Well, then,' The happy ending, I gather, with the oh my loves and the dearest and the swooning and the blech. With a toss of a knobble junk garnished tail, she trotted up and around the top of the overhang shadowing the cave entrance, looking down on the two of them with the same sly smile. I will say this, Bonbon, and I'll say it willingly, although I may have to eat soap for it to get the taste out of my mouth afterwards. This end, you earned it. It's been fun. I'll be back. She gave a long, low bow and then slunk out of view behind the waving stalks of timothy grass, heath lobelia, and stunted heather. Lyra turned to Bonbon, bon, but the changeling raised the hoof and said, Wait for it. Sure enough, within a few seconds, Aldervandra's cluttered head popped back into view. She gave a brief nod to Bonbon, bon, and then, addressing Lyra, said, Three things. First, that business with the giant walking Gamara was a good start. Try for something bigger and more smashy next time. Second, ask Bonbon bon to show you her balancing act sometime. It's a gem. Third, I'll probably be dropping by your lair in the future. I wish to consult Bonbon bon on the subject of existential dread. And I'll want food. Now, normally I think you ponies have all the culinary talent of a stump full of dead snails, but I was in Canterlot recently and I discovered a remarkable delicacy called Mr. Frisky's Cat Nibbles, which has made me revise my earlier opinions. That stuff is amazing. As good hosts, I shall expect you to have plenty in stock when I drop by. Right, I think that's it. Toodles! She flashed another grin, and then with a rustle of grass and a rattle and clatter, she was gone. It was cold, and the high mountain winds were blowing. Tattered fragments of clouds tumbling and swirling in misty disarray drifted among the meadow grasses or rushed in silent violence against the unyielding bulk of the canterhorn itself. Canterlot shone pure and perfect and golden in the distance, only partially obscured by the shifting mists. There would be bells ringing there, the sounds of celebration and happiness, joy and relief, but from where they stood neither Bonbon nor Lyra could hear them. They were alone, and it was cold. Lyra broke the silence first. Drawing a deep breath, she said, I didn't realize. I thought you had just, I don't know, somehow gotten trapped or tricked by those things, or something like that. But that creature? That Kelpie? You knew her. I mean, you understood her. You understood her even better than Luna did. I didn't think. I didn't understand. 
I didn't realize how big this might be. You tried to tell me, but I just didn't get it. Averting her eyes, Bonbon said, I didn't try very hard, but then you know that now. Yeah, Lyra considered. Well, I guess now's the time, now or never. I don't... I'm not even sure I want to know what the answer to this is anymore, but I have to ask it anyway. And I need to answer it. Yeah. Kneeling and angling her head upward in an attempt to look into the changeling's downcast eyes, Lyra asked, Bonbon, bon, what are you? Bonbon bon took a few faltering steps backwards, edging towards the squat black maw of the cave. A lot of things, but probably the most important one is that I'm a liar. I've lied to the world, lied to myself, and worse, lied to you. That ends now. She felt tears welling up in her eyes, blinked fiercely, and continued. But there's one thing you need to know before I say any more. One thing that was always true, no matter what else may have been a lie. Lyra, I always loved you. I love you now, and I always will love you, no matter what. That's the single real truth that everything else was built around. You were always loved. Never doubt that. Lyra gave a weak, worried smile. I don't, Bon Bon. I never did. I know. The changeling sighed and closed her eyes. But the thing that loved you, well... A venomous, writhing warmth flared beyond Bon Bon's eyelids, and dancing green flames flickered over the surface of her lenses, scorching away everything that was sane and normal about them. She slowly slid her eyelids open again, revealing the glassy, electric-blue compound eyes of a changeling, and finished. It wasn't quite what it claimed it was. Lyra's eyes widened in shock, and Bon Bon rushed on, hurrying to say what needed to be said while she could still bear to say it. I'm a changeling, Lyra. The same kind of monster that Queen Chrysalis is, and although I'm not strong enough now to transform all the way, if I could, I'd look sort of like her, fangs and wings and all. My real name is Mendax. It's an old name from back when Discord first ruled. Roughly translated, it means liar. Appropriate, I guess, because Bon Bon was just a pony I made up. The reason she never had much to say about her past was because she never had much of a past to talk about. But I've known you for years. How could... I don't... Lyra's voice shook like a moth trapped in a spider's web, shaking and shivering against a fate that it knew it couldn't escape. Bonbon bon hung her head. I'm so sorry, sweetie. I wish I hadn't. I wish, I wish, I wish. But what's the point of that? But it's true. My voice shifts all over the place because I'm a changeling. I'm not very good at keeping the shape of my throat constant. I can't stand horseshoes because I'm a changeling and iron burns changelings, just like the iron poker burned the bagain back in the caves. Midsummer and midwinter, Imbolg and Lunsana, Beltane and Samhain, they're all hard times for me because I'm a changeling. It's on those days that fairy strongest, and I can hear the horns of the wild hunt in the sky. I can see and hear it all, because I'm a changeling. Every day of my life I've had to fight to stay here with you, in the real world, and not get sucked back into fairy. With a sigh, she added, and some days were harder than others. The wind swept past them, cold and high and dry, rushing through their manes and tails and sending the long hairs billowing around their stiff bodies. Bonbon bon hunched and guilt-stricken, and Lyra still as a midwinter tree, eyes wide and face drained of color. Raising a heavy hoof, the changeling turned towards the cave entrance. There, that's everything, I think. If I hadn't lied to you for so long, and if it wasn't what I was, none of this would have happened. I'm just, I'm so sorry. Bonbon bon trotted slowly towards the gaping hole in the ground. Go back to the sunlight, and try to be happy. Try to forget me. I'm not worth your love. There was a quiet clink of stones scraping against one another as she edged under the overhanging ledge of clay and thatch into the darkness. Wait! Bonbon bon looked back. Lyra. Wait. The pale green unicorn trotted forward, moving with halting and certain steps, and knelt on the pebbled moss in front of the cave. Raising herself halfway up out of the pit, Bonbon bon rested her forehooves on the little grassy ledge and looked up into her mare friend's face. She noticed her own eyes reflected in Lyra's, glowing eerie blue against the unicorn's amber irises, and twitched her head away. She didn't want to see that glow. She didn't want to be reminded of. Just, before you go, could you, could you say something? What? She looked back to her mare friend. The unicorn's eyes were wide, and her face was drained of color, but her ears were pitched forward, not flattened back in fear. Bonbon bon stammered. Lyra, I, I don't think I have anything else to say. I've broken everything. It's all just pieces now. But, the unicorn took a deep breath and closed her eyes, just say something. It doesn't matter what. It doesn't have to be serious or anything, and it doesn't have to be about us. It might be better if it wasn't, actually. Just talk. I need to hear you talk. Well, okay. Bon Bon lowered her eyes, thinking, um, I'm sort of cold, I suppose. The sky is uh, a pretty color now, very blue and sun and moon. I completely forgot. 
I got some blue paint and sandpaper for the cellar door to fix that awful scratch in it, but I was in such a hurry to get back home that I left it behind. Now I suppose you'll have to get some yourself, since I won't be... I'm not. Oh, Lyra, I can't do this. Please. Her mare friend's eyes were still closed, her head bent forward, and her horn almost touching Bonbon's forehead. Sandpaper and blue paint is good. Keep talking about that, like none of this had happened. When the changeling hesitated, she added, Please, Bonbon. Right. With a sigh, the blue-eyed creature continued, It was lapis lazuli paint. You'll need to get that, otherwise it won't match the door properly. And I don't know if I locked the front door when I left, so I'll need to make sure that nothing is missing. You locked it, murmured Lyra. You always do. With a wan smile, Bonbon answered, I suppose I do. But all the same, you should check, just to be sure. She paused, thinking, Also, I never got the mess from the broken bathroom door cleaned up. I really should have. There was a little time before the train for Canelot arrives, and it wouldn't have taken long. Oh, dear. And that door won't be cheap to replace, either. I've got a stash of bits that you can use to pay for it, though. It's in a little bag in the kitchen closet behind... Behind the mop, underneath the pile of rags, finished Lyra. Bonbon raised her head, surprised. That's right. I was saving it up so I could buy you a watchmaker's lathe. You were always complaining about how the one you have is no good for machining really fine pieces, and I knew you'd need to make a lot of little tiny parts for your portable finger. I thought it'd make a really good anniversary present. How did you know about that? I do sometimes clean around the house, you know. When I tell you to. The small smile on the changeling's face faded. When I told you to. When... When... The words caught in her throat as the full weight of what she'd lost crashed back down on her. She couldn't drag this out any longer. She couldn't bear to. Choking out a strangled sorry, the miserable mare started to lower herself into the cave, but stopped at the touch of Lyra's hoof on her shoulder. She looked up. The unicorn was gazing into Bonbon's upturned eyes, a strange expression on her face. In a barely audible voice, she murmured, "'House cleaning and lathes.' Then, to Bonbon's utter stupefaction, her mare friend hooked her hooves under the changeling's forelimbs, hoisted her halfway out of the cave, and folded her in a tight embrace, nickering reassuringly into her tasseled mane. Bonbon whinnied in shock. Hush, hush, Bonnie, hush. It's okay. Lyra gave another soft nicker. I don't know, but I think it's all going to be okay. Without quite meaning to, Bonbon raised her forehose and wrapped them around her mare friend, clinging to her like a frightened foal. But I don't understand. How can you... I'm a monster. I'm not what you thought I was. Maybe not, but you are who I thought you were. With a gentle nudge of her hoof, Lyra raised Bonbon's head up so the changeling's blue, crystalline eyes met her amber ones. You know something? When I was first getting to know you, it wasn't your fits or your weird thing about horseshoes or all the rest that was hardest for me. She gave a crooked half-smile. It was your voice. It was always changing, always different. Sure, it was silly, but I felt you were always changing, too. Like I'd start to get to understand you, and then your voice would shift and you'd suddenly just disappear, and there'd be the strange pony at my side who I'd never met before. I didn't know how to deal with it. The tousle-maned unicorn pressed her forehead against bonbons. I eventually figured out I was being stupid. It was always you, under the weird accents and jumping pitches. Always. It didn't matter how you sounded, it mattered what you said, and what you said was always so... you. And then, well, I started to fall in love with you. With the real you. Didn't really mean to, but it happened. And I've never regretted it for a second. Lyra leaned back, a hoof resting on the changeling's shoulder, and continued. And it's still you in there, I can tell. What other pony would trek all the way from Ponyville to Canterlot, fighting Baganes and Kelpies and I don't know what else, and then start beating herself up for forgetting to make sure the house was tidy before she left? What other pony, after saving Equestria, would worry about whether or not she'd locked the front door? What other pony would think that metalworking tools, of all things, would make a good anniversary present? With an uncertain, scared little smile, Bonbon bon said, Not a pony, remember? And that was kind of stupid of me. I should have gotten you something more romantic that... And what other pony, interrupted Lyra, her voice strong and certain now, would know me well enough to be right? I'm not giving you up, Bonnie. I couldn't find somebody else like you, or some changeling, if you like. Whatever. In a thousand years. It doesn't matter what your voice is like. It doesn't matter what your eyes are like. It doesn't matter if you've got a horn or wings or all black and scaly and your legs are poked full of holes. I know it's still you, and I know you're worth loving. If you think I'm going to let you crawl away into the dark and lose yourself, you've got another thing coming. Ain't happening, Philly. The wind shifted, rushing down from the glittering golden towers of Canterlot and sweeping up the two mares across the meadow, bringing with it the sound of bells and the scent of wildflowers. Lyra locked forehoes with Bonbon and lifted her the rest of the way out of the cave mouth. I can't say that a little bit more honesty wouldn't have been nice, but do you think I hate you for not telling me what you are? Do you think I hate you for being hurt and scared and exhausted? Bonbon, I wouldn't have left you. 
I would never have left you. I would have helped you. Extending a hoof, she nudged the changeling's chin up, letting sunlight fall in her bruised, dirty face. We can make this work. It's weird and kind of freaky, but I think we can make this work. Bonbon bon took a deep breath. The air was cold and fragrant with alpine flowers, but she could also smell Lyra's distinctive scent, familiar and alive with a smell of copper and rosin, oil and coffee. Reaching out, she drew Lyra into a tight embrace. You might be right about that. A weak, happy smell crept across her face, and she raised the hoof, rubbing clumsily at her eyes. I think you might just be right.